welcome to our sorcery. I'm Alfredo Martinez, and I have with me the one and only Disco Magal. How you going, Disco? Hey, what's up, man? How are you? I'm doing good, uh, and uh, it's good to have you on the channel. Uh, it's good to go ahead and uh, sit down, have a magical chat. Um, and uh, weren't you Disco Palacios earlier? <laughs> yes, <laughs> actually, uh, my last name is Palacios, and so uh, I was actually in a channeling session one time, and I got a a word uh, for you know I was kind of trying to channel a magical name, and I got Magal, and I looked it up in in Hebrew. It means like scythe. So I thought that was really interesting. So I just thought I'd go ahead and throw it onto the disco. So it became Disco Magal. So I like it. I like it a lot. That's pretty cool. Right on. Um, now, how did your magical path begin? Where did this all start? <laughs> oh, man. I mean, that's a really good question because there's so much to it. You know, like when I was a kid, I grew up next to a cemetery. And it started back then before I even knew that it had started. You know, I had a lot of paranormal I mean, a lot compared to some, not that many compared to others, I guess, you know, but I had some paranormal experiences when I was a kid. Uh, and then it just kind of, I had this, I mean, I go into detail as much detail or as little as you'd like with that. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Go well, ahead. Yeah, so, okay. Yeah. I mean, when I used to have somebody knock on my door at night a lot and I, it was like, I would just hear this knocking on my door and I never knew who it was. And uh, one day I started like just yelling at it. My mom comes to the door. I was like, come in. And she comes to the door. She's like, what are you doing? I was like, what do you want? And she's like, what do you mean? And I was like, well, you're knocking on my door. And she's like, I wasn't knocking on your door. I'm like, well, whatever. Tell whoever it is to stop. And then I went to sleep. And uh, but it was just like, you know, stuff like that would, would happen. And then, you know, I remember I was doing rituals when I was a kid. I remember I sat down when I was really young. I got a candle and put it in front of a mirror. This is before I was a practitioner. I didn't know what I was doing. I just kind of went, you know, just put this candle in front of the mirror, turn off the, all the lights. And then I sat there and stared at it for a long time. Then all of a sudden I got this inner vision of myself, like my circulatory system. It was a trip and it just like a flash, you know, how when you first starting out, stuff yeah. like that kind of happens. Right. So that was my, that was one of them. Also, I used to pray to the moon when I was a little kid for some reason. I don't know, you know, like, um, and then, uh, I had a few different, just like weird experiences in the cemetery. I'd go to the cemetery like as a shortcut, because it was a shortcut from where we used to go hang out. And I would see shadow people, you know, if you have any experience with shadow people, they like to peek around stuff a lot, you know? Yeah. So they're like behind trees, you would see them kind of poke their head out and stuff like that, you know? And yeah. it never scared me though. It was always just kind of like, hey guys, what's up, you know? And uh, I think from there, it kind of led into like my whole practice. Like anytime I encounter any shadow type entities, since they are a hive mentality, I just kind of talked to them and I introduced myself. Hey, remember me from a long time ago when I was a kid, you know, and uh, it's like a camaraderie, I guess. You know, they all they know who I am. So, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, uh, that's interesting that you approached it that way. Were you raised with religion or any other spiritual your, your parents? Yeah, you're you're starting to cut out a little bit, man. So uh, I think you said it was I raised in any type of religion. Right, right. Uh, yeah, actually, in the in uh, Hispanic culture, we, a lot of us we grew up Christian. Uh, but the difference between our family, it was like Baptist. So it was like Mexican Baptist, which was odd. But yeah, so it wasn't something I could really talk about. You know, it was it was. Uh, but a lot of the people in the church had. Like I had an uncle who was a preacher and in the church, there would be like he would hear people in the in the hallways, like talking and laughing and stuff. And uh, yeah. so I guess it was kind of like a family thing, you know, uh, which later on, whenever I learned about my ancestry and I've spoken to some of my ancestors that we do have like a family kind of lineage that leads back to Lucifer, actually. So I thought that was really cool. And so um it is definitely something that is there, you know, but I didn't really learn until I became an actual practitioner, you know? Yeah, the, the reason I ask is because, um, you know, some people, the way that the way that you approach it, a lot of people raised in religion don't necessarily approach it that way. You know what I mean? They're, they have a closed minded. Oh, the Bible says this, that mm -hmm. you actually had an open mind and, and approached it in a different way. Didn't judge it. Um, in fact, you you had mentioned about, you know, growing up. Baptist, Mexican Baptist. I grew up Mexican Pentecostal, so I can I can relate. So I grew up going to to Hispanic Baptist churches and stuff like that. 
but uh yeah very interesting um now uh let me just touch on this i noticed in your early videos on your channel it was a lot to do with artwork yeah uh, yeah where your interest in art come from i i grew up uh like i mean i could psychologically pinpoint it i remember whenever I think when we're growing up, we don't have an identity, you know, so we're trying to find our identity. And I remember there was a time when I guess I had drawn a rose and then my grandmother really liked it. And then she put it up on her wall. So it kind of gave me that, you know, I knew that she appreciated it. So I wanted to do that more kind of a thing. Like I was a good artist, you know, even though I was a little kid, I was good for my age, but it, it kind of something that resonated with me. So since then I was an artist and uh, that's where all of that started. So I've been an artist like my whole life. Never really did anything substantial with it. I did go to school for graphic design, but if you ever gone to any type of design school, that does not necessarily mean you use some artistry in there, but not with design work is different. You know, it, right. I was, but uh, that's why I don't do graphic design now. It's not the same as being an artist. You know, being an artist is different. But uh, yeah, so I've always been an artist, and it, that's what's kind of the reason why I like doing sigils so much. I actually like to do sigils. I can channel sigils really easily. And uh, anything in, in, involved in the arts, I've always been really attuned to. Like, I also play guitar and sing, you know, and stuff like that. And uh, write music a little bit here and there, you know. But uh, I think as Latinos, that's something a lot of us do. We're very art, you know, artistic. Mm -hmm. It is, especially, you know, like if you have a lot of cousins or uncles who may have done time and you see their artwork and you they you know oh let me just try that you know i can see yeah. what you mean you know yeah yeah definitely that's um, what uh, that's funny that you actually mentioned doing time when i was i remember when i was in uh i was locked up for a little while i actually did a viaje of like la santa muerte and some lowriders and stuff and i sent to lowrider art the magazine they never yeah. published it man but i was like i was I, I would get the issue issues and i would try to see if they ever did and they never did, but it was, you know, I tried. <laughs> yeah, it was. I think if you did it again, eventually you'll get in one of them. You know, oh. there's so many of them out there now, you know. Mm -hmm. so, um, now, I uh, was watching one of your videos and you were speaking on the meaning of life. And one thing that I like that you said is that it can be, the meaning of life can be different for everybody. Some people define it as an individual or as societal, like from an individual or a societal perspective. Mm. Um, I like how you broke that down because a lot of people will say, oh, the meaning of life is this or the meaning of life is that or ultimately is this. You say it can be anything you want depending on how you approach it. Can you go ahead and, and uh, explain that to the viewer? Yeah, sure. Uh, so basically... Um... I experienced what I felt was the meaning of life at a certain point. And then when you go into this, like looking for the answers there, uh, there's this whole um, kind of like umbrella thing, like mentality that people think that nobody has ever known the meaning of life. Well, this is like totally not true. You know what I'm saying? Everybody, uh, especially uh, in old philosophy, because I took philosophy class when I was in college and every single like philosophy structure, like whatever, any kind of philosophical structure, like, um, isms or whatever you know each one of them thought that their answer was the meaning of life so every all of them thought they had the meaning of life obviously it was different for all of them so that's kind of where i i got that's where i got that from that's where it blossomed so everybody has a different meaning of life and actually that can even change throughout your life you know what i'm saying so it's kind of like if you don't think you have a, there's a meaning to life i mean it's i think society the way it is now kind of pushes that but your meaning of life can be anything that you want it to be. And it could change from one minute to the next or one year to the next. You know, uh, it kind of takes your power away to think that you don't have any power over this meaning of life. You know what I'm saying? So uh, if you accept that it is constantly changing, it's like it's constant motion, then you can you always have meaning, you know, instead of ha never having meaning, you know. Uh, yeah. And it. I think that's a good way of looking at it. I also think it, it can change, you know, take, for instance, if you, you know, go ahead and start working with a spirit devoutly, you know, it can change in that way. It can change, you know, all kinds of ways. So I, I like yeah. that. Approach. And right uh, you had mentioned uh, that the secret of life isn't that things get easier. It's that we get better at them. Yeah. Mm hmm. 
Yeah, I like that you said that. Um, now, uh, I was watching another video of yours on uh, focusing your intent in magic. Mm. Uh, you said to be specific, and you said um, it depends on what and how you ask deities. You know what I mean? Like how you ask them de can depend on what information you get back, whether it's worthwhile. Like um, you had mentioned something about about the way you ask deities. Can you go ahead and, and uh, explain that? Okay, um, I don't remember that video. I made a few, you know what I'm saying? But basically, um, right. I'm just gonna wing it because like, again, I don't know exactly what I said. So like to, to pertain to that actual video, but like, yeah, the way you ask deities is, is like the answer you're, you're um, the way that I see it now. Okay, so I'm gonna explain to my, my videos basically. So when I started my videos, uh, one of the reasons I started making videos on YouTube was because uh, it was very hard to find information for me that was pertaining to what I was looking for because people would explain things in a certain kind of way. And they it seemed that there was like this cookie cutter way of explaining it. And it seemed that they had all watched like one video and they all explained it based on that video. Like I will go into like meditation. They would say it was all, it was all basically the same video, but different people making the same video. They would be like, if you get a thought, just push it out of your mind, you know? And it, that wasn't really working for me. Or if they say your chakras, just spin your chakras counterclockwise. It didn't say if, if like counterclockwise, if I'm looking at myself or if counterclockwise, if you know. So there was like details that weren't in there that really uh, were confusing to me at that time and would like just kind of could frustrate you at that time. So I started making those videos as like a video kind of like documentary as like as I was growing. And so a lot of my videos you'll see is like, hey, I learned this you should try it too, you know? Uh, so as far as like how you approach the deity, that's what you're gonna, that's what you're gonna get back. It, it really depends on like, you know, if I, I think a lot of that came from whenever um, I first started learning how to channel, Moloch was the first entity that came to me and he matched my aura. Cause that's where I was at at the time. You know what I'm saying? So that's how I was approaching him. So they can approach you any way that they want to, but how you approach them is how they're going to come back at you. Oh, I see. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Because that's they know what you're going to understand. That's why you have so many people that like, some people see stuff easier. Some people hear stuff or whatever, you know, because that's where they're at. You know, that's whatever frequency they're at or however you want to explain that. But, you know, the entities can match whatever. And they're going to go with your strongest way of, of communicating. You know, if you're an artist, they're going to come at you artistically or whatever, you know. So uh, that's what I mean by that. Okay. Okay. So in a sense, it's kind of like uh, like a first, depending on how you know. I'm sorry. You can't answer you. Or... Can you say that again? Sorry. All right. Uh, like depending on like like when you meet somebody for the first time, how you come at them determines how um, how they'll go, how they'll come at you and respond to you. That that is one way to look at it. Is yes. It, is, okay. mm -hmm. If I'm polite to somebody, right? Yeah, if I'm polite to somebody, they more like more than likely they'll be polite, uh, polite to me. But it also means like it could be language as well. Like, you know, if I speak Spanish, they're gonna come at me like that. You know, uh, if I speak English or whatever other language. Uh, so it's not just it, it's it's it could be all different kinds of ways. So that's why I left that kind of vague because it's kind of like whatever way you approach them. If you're an Italian uh, musician, you know what I'm saying? Then they were, they're going to come back at you. Like, you know, you're going to hear a song that would maybe trigger something. Uh, some old Italian um, folk song that would trigger a certain emotion in you. That, you know, that right. would, that emotion that you need in order to make a connection to them in whatever way. You know, I feel that emotional memory is more potent than actual memory. You know what I'm saying? That makes any sense. That's, that, that does make sense. It ties in with with, with the next thing um, you had mentioned about recreating a sigil because mm -hmm. you pushed out lion creating. Um, so it's like a lot of people don't realize that when they're creating something, the emotion they put into it goes along with it, even if it's got doubt. Um, but can you go ahead and bring 
pray, uh, explain that about recreating a sigil because self doubt is and the of witness. Okay, I heard. Sorry, man, our connection is, is still kind of choppy. Uh, yesterday we couldn't do this because the connection was so bad. But uh, what I heard was you're saying right. uh, you wanted me to explain how uh, creating a sigil emotion goes into that sigil, right? Yeah. How, how it's necessary to recreate it sometimes. How it's necessary? necessary to, to, oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're not like necessarily going to get it right the first time all the time. So you you work with it in order to get it right. Right. OK, so uh, yeah. Uh, basically, um, sometimes, you know, you do get a hit. You, it's it's right away. But that's normally for me. Whenever I'm working on a sigil, they come to me and just give me something. Then I know that, that you know, I will do I will start working on it and I will gauge it by my emotion, like how how um, I design it. You know what I'm saying? If I'm starting to. It's kind of like channeling. It's it's channeling. So if you start just going off your uh, your mind and making stuff up, you're going to start losing that emotional connection. And then you know that, OK, you're kind of going off a little bit. So sometimes you may need to kind of put that to the side, start recreating where you were at and where you started losing it. Just kind of stop there and then let that emotion come in again and then start working with that. You know, sometimes it comes in. It's really fast. You can just do a kind of like a a quick. Um, kind of like when you get a download, a download sometimes, you know, um, I can't hear you at all right now, so I'm just going to speak. Uh, so a download is just like you just get a lot of information at once and it can like span over whatever, right? So it's really quick. So you can actually even do use that download and try to mimic the speed of that download. Just kind of like move your hand really quick in a way to just kind of get something out. And then you can actually use that to tap into a sigil as well. I I've used that technique. Um, but yeah, like so exactly like what you were saying, I heard you mention about doubt. So if you start doubting yourself, Already that part of the sigil is no good. You know what I'm saying? You, because that emotional trigger in there is actually now that's part of that sigil and you don't want that in the sigil because you're creating doubt and you don't want that in your magic. Um, I think sigils are kind of like a bargain you're making with uh, the entities when you're working with them. So they're not just giving it to you. They're giving it to you and you're working with them uh, through that emotion and you're creating it with that emotion involved. So that's kind of what happens. You know what I'm saying? It's like a almost like a little contract you guys are writing out, but in a sigil form, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, it makes sense. It makes sense. Um, you also uh, spoke on how why demons cause turmoil in our lives. Yes. Um, and thinking about re to restructure our subconscious mind. And mm -hmm. you made an analogy about shooting an arrow in the wind. Mm hmm. Yeah, can you go ahead and break that down for our listeners? OK, yeah, I don't remember exactly how I broke it down before, but basically, yes. Uh, so we have these comfort zones that um, we create throughout life. And in these comfort zones, we, we create this structure. And uh, in that structure, like again, we're comfortable. So society, you know, we build like uh, different kinds of let me see, like limitations upon ourselves based upon those structures as we understand reality to be. So whenever we have turmoil, that is us that basically our egos fighting against uh, the demons restructuring what we need to restructure in order to be able to work through. So all that shit is the wind, you know what I'm saying? And your error would be your intent. So if your intent is this, you know, whatever you're trying to do, the wind is like uh, somebody when you were fucking 15 years old said something that, oh, you can't do that. And that emotion kind of comes through. It could throw off the arrow a little bit, you know, or, you know, just all kinds of examples like that, you know, or like your parents said you weren't good enough for something. That's kind of a, a vague example, but that could kind of throw everything off. And those emotions are tied to events that happen in your life that those those are in inside of your subconscious mind. And those are those things are what's causing those emotions, uh, those doubts that you have, you know. So in order to break that shit down, uh, the demonic has to uh, basically cause turmoil. So you have to reevaluate those traumas with trauma in order to restructure that shit that's blocking whatever it is that you're trying to do. Uh, and that's not necessarily just for spell work or intent. That could be for anything, you know, opening your mind to certain experiences. You know, if I believe that. 
um, if I believe a certain way, then um, I need and I need to believe another kind of way in order to be successful in another action. Let's say meditation it takes a lot of work in order to be to be good at meditating, to become prevalent in meditation or, you know, and physical exercise. And it's all kind of the same thing. So phys physically, you have to become more you have to break down barriers like uh, your belief systems, like what you can do physically and what you can't do physically. And that changes over time. You know, just with the demonic, it's more, uh, like I said, traumatic and it's more boom. You know what I'm saying? That's why a lot of people think that demons are bad because this turmoil that happens when it's not actually bad. It's just tearing down those structures that feels bad because your ego is like, whoa, I don't like this shit. You know what I'm saying? It feels ugly. You're like, whoa, you know, and it's a shitty feeling. But that shitty feeling comes with like some uh, power behind it. And, you know, you open up yourself to that. Uh, those experiences afterwards, now those walls are down and now you become more powerful. So that's why you become more powerful because those structures and those uh, hindrances that were there are torn down now. Right. Yeah. Um, let's speak a bit about Santa Muerte. Okay. And speak about the first time you saw Santa Muerte. All right. Uh, so uh, physically, I saw her in this room, actually. So uh, it was right back there. And at this time, I was a very, I was still new. <clears throat> I had heard about Santa Muerte, <clears throat> and uh, you know, I, was, I was already you know obviously I was working with her, but uh, not to the extent that I do now. But at that time, I didn't have. So I have like uh, sheets over my my windows that are behind me. You can see sheets now. I have sheets all over. I kind of create sacred spaces within my room, and so um, so there were sheets weren't up at the time. So the lights from the outside will come through. And I had just put an altar up, like uh, devoted just to her. I had like altars, like with Lucifer, and I had I put a statue of her with that, you know, with on top of that altar, blah blah blah. But this day, I made it specifically to her. I devoted the entire altar to her and restructured everything to where it was just her. Uh, that night, I was laying in my bed, uh, and I looked over, and I saw a shadowy, like a dark shadow. It was like void. It was like this black figure. And the reason I mentioned before the lighting is because I could see the, the darkness there. It wasn't a trick of light. You know what I'm saying? It was too big of a thing. And it was like, it was round like that and like, like La Santa Muerte, you know what I'm saying? Like uh, that figure. And uh, it went up all the way to the ceiling, which I think standard ceilings are like, like fucking eight feet high or something like that, or seven to eight, whatever. It depends on where you're at. But uh, it was at the ceiling and it went down to the ground. And I, when I saw it, I was like, what the fuck is that? And I felt that it was something. It was, you know, wasn't a shadow, like the typical way you would think of shadow. And it was, like I said, it was void. It was darker than dark. And it was like in the middle of the night. And I was just like, whoa. And it tripped me the fuck out and it actually scared the shit out of me. I didn't know what to do. I was just like, okay, what the fuck uh, was, what was I going to do? I mean, I was so afraid. I didn't start thinking. I couldn't think of like karate moves or nothing. You know what I'm saying, man? I was just like, I was freaked the fuck out. <laughs> and then, uh, Whenever, uh, then I realized I had this epiphany that I was like, oh shit, that's La Santa Muerte, you know what I'm saying? And as soon as I made that realization, I was like, I just said thank you. I said thank you to her and just like kind of just turned around. You know, when you're a little kid, you put the covers over you because monsters can't get through fucking blankets, bro. Like, I don't know if you know that shit. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I didn't do none of that. I just turned around and just, you know, put it over my shoulder. I was like, thank you. You know, she would just let me know she was there. And uh, after that, I felt real safe and I fell asleep. But yeah, it was pretty, it was a trip, man experience um you had mentioned that santa muerte is actually an egregore doorway to the aztec underworld okay so now uh when i mentioned egregoric doorway so i really don't know how to say you know what i'm saying because she is definitely a doorway so she is not so this is what happened like so not very long ago i would tell you if you were to ask me who santa muerte was i would say that she is miktikatsiwa right you know what i'm saying i would have said that in the middle of writing a book that i was writing about her uh i was told uh so i do uh, like an offering to her i give her like coffee and vanilla and stuff like that uh i give her vanilla because i channeled that she was the black flower or no that mick lanticutli was the black flower and he, that's what he told me so and what that means is an aztec you know back in the mexica days they called the black flowers vanilla because it has black flowers or whatever right so that's where i get vanilla from so uh anyways i give coffee as an offering to vanilla so i was sitting there giving an offering and then i was i got this uh, this download telling me that uh 
because I was doing, I was trying to learn more about Miklantikutli for the book, right? Because I wanted to include Miklantikutli as well as Miklantikutli. And so what I was told there was that they were the same. And I was like, really? And then, so, but it made sense. If you talk to a lot of people who are um, practitioners or devotees, they say that there's, they feel there's a masculine uh, aspect to La Santa Muerte. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people feel that. So um, it made sense. And as I went in deeper and actually spoke to a couple other practitioners, uh, it was mentioned to me that um, that she was, by some of them, believed that she was, was an aspect of the entire Aztec pantheon. So when I checked in on that, uh, I got a yes. But also when I was doing the meditation on it, I got so I was sitting there in front of the statue doing a meditation. And what happened was it was like a doorway. So what I connected with her and then all of a sudden it was like a flip. And then I was in this big, huge under dark underworld, like a cave. I saw Miklantikutli. Um, I saw Miklantikutli. I saw Xolot. I saw other other Aztec entities that I'm, I'm not a, familiar with um, at this time. And just like a few of them, they were all around La Santa Muerte. So she was like a central figure, like a beacon kind of a thing, right? And then all of them were around. So what I was shown was and understood was that she was the doorway to get to all of them. So she, and as I channeled further, actually what she said was um, basically that she hid within uh, the Christian kind of like religion be under this saint kind of a thing uh, to move forward like to not be forgotten, you know what I'm saying? So that's what that's why that was done. So she chose to be uh, feminine because um, I forgot why she said exactly. I don't know if it was to go against, like, to kind of show that to go against like um, the masculine aspect of what the Christian religion is, you know, or it was just like to represent the opposite of it to show you that there was something else there in a way. It was it was kind of weird. I don't really know exactly how she meant that yet. You know what I'm saying? But basically, that's what she was showing me. That, so that's why I say an egregore doorway. It's not like it's an egregore doorway, but it's not an egregore doorway. I don't really know how to say what it is, but it's definitely a doorway. If that makes any sense. You no, know, I, I understand. I understand. Okay, cool. Thanks. <laughs> uh, and so. Now that we're coming towards the end of this video, uh, I saw that you recently joined Lawless Metaphysics. Congrats yes. on that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, and uh, for those of you viewers uh, checking this video out, I'll go ahead and have uh, a link below this video, not only to Disco's channel, but to Lawless Metaphysics, their channel as well. They have a lot of good stuff. Go ahead and check them out. Um, uh, Disco, thank you for coming on. It's been uh, uh, very uh, good talking with you. Um, and as I said to the viewers, all his stuff I will have below. Anything you want to plug before we go ahead and uh, uh, end this interview? Uh, the only thing that I um, would plug at this time would be I have this right called the Auric Fire. Um, to me, this right is like to, it's 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 been transformative to everybody who receives it. Um, you know, like basically I'll do a little commercial for it. You know, it, it is uh, it is transformative. It basically empowers your aura. It does all kinds of cool shit. And I got it from Makostroma. She's a Slavic uh, entity. And uh, basically what I do is I, it's all, all again, like a servitor, but it's, you know, it's, it's like a familiar that kind of hangs around you and helps you and guides you, protects you. And I've had reports about this whenever I first, it was going to be just for protection and good luck and like help with money and stuff like that. Right. But uh, as soon as I had a few people, I have regular clients that I, I try it out on, you know, and uh, they had, crazy experiences like i've had kundalini experiences reported by several people i had one guy that he didn't know what the fuck to do he had such a crazy experience he was just like bro i had to kind of coach him through what he was going through he basically had like an awakening and he was just like man i don't know what to think i'm having all these crazy dreams i'm like yo bro it's all right that's the universe just talking to you it's cool you know i had to talk him through that shit he just like he was if i wouldn't have been there i think he probably would have gone crazy you know what I'm saying he was just like he didn't know what the fuck to do he was seeing stuff and I was like, bro, it's all right, you know, but uh, it's it's wake it's wicked powerful, and you can empower it with all kinds of stuff. I've developed other rights, you know, to empower it. But the orc fire by itself, it's like 
in its posterity. So basically, it moves through your family line. So when you die, if you don't assign it to anybody or yourself in your next life, it moves on to your next of kin that it feels most attracted to, right? And for some of us who were practitioners, if we want it to be with us in our next life, it can follow us, just give it instructions to go. And you can do that at any time. It's not only whenever I implant it on, I assign it to you or, you know, because I create it and I assign it to you. Um, but it's not only whenever you, uh, when I make the uh, org fire, I program it to, ch you can change it whenever you want to. So if you're about to die and you're like, yo, I want this to stay with me. I don't want it to go to them. You can do that. You know what I'm saying? Or if for some reason you move on to just like some other energetic body and you just become like, a god or whatever it is later you know whatever it is you manifest into it will then merge with you into your next energetic form or whatever you know so that's the only thing i'll plug i think nobody else has anything like it i think it's very beneficial like the reports i've had are just crazy about what it can do so yeah. it's the first that i've heard of it so yeah good stuff and all uh, to our viewers i'll go ahead and have all his services below this video um uh, but yeah uh, thank you disco for uh coming to the channel it's been nice talking with you and Thanks. to uh, all the viewers at home you're, you're welcome uh, yeah. go ahead and like subscribe to dark sorcerer yeah Until thank you for time. having me man i had a good time thanks very welcome